and welcome to Coasset Political Society's show. I'm your host, Marcus Rowland. On this episode, we will have a look into the Mueller investigation and what has been revealed by the special counsel and what is coming up next. After that, we will be looking into Brexit as it rapidly comes to a close in the coming days. To start with, though, the Mueller investigation. It seems that this two-year-long investigation is finally coming to a close. Recently, Robert Mueller released a report surrounding his investigation. His report included a statement that said he found no evidence for collusion between the campaign of President Donald Trump and the Russians. However, his statement said he could not conclude on whether or not the president had committed obstruction of justice. The Republicans are standing in triumph, declaring that this has vindicated the president of all crimes and declaring that the alleged witch hunt over. They are now pointing fingers at the Democrats in a more or less I told you sort of way. The president is also not shying away from pointing blame at the Democrats and seems quite victorious. The Democrats, by contrast, do not see the struggle as over. They want to see the full report from Robert Mueller, claiming that Congress should be able to make the decisions surrounding obstruction of justice and collusion on their own. Many from the left are trying to pivot and refocus on policy issues, such as health care, immigration, and infrastructure reform. Many others are still calling for impeachment procedures to begin. The Republicans and Democrats now seem to argue over how the, the report should be presented. The Democrats want it in full. The Republicans, on the other hand, want Mueller to redact large parts of it to protect the identities of those involved and most likely prevent further investigation into the Trump campaign. 2020 Democratic candidates are not brushing away from the issue either. Instead, they are still calling for the president to be removed. It looks like the 2020 campaign trail will be filled with the issue, whether or not it will have effect on the voters. With that, I would like to turn to our panelists for some comments on the Mueller investigation and the campaign road ahead. I'd like to introduce uh, our panelists. On the left, I have Ben Bernsey and Kate Wanta, and on the right, I have John Keenan and Matt Grimes. So, uh, we are discussing the Mueller investigation, I'm sure. You on the right have many great things to say about this. Well, it's, it's fabulous. I mean, it was a complete and total victory for the president. Democrats and the media have been claiming for two years they colluded with Russians. They gave themselves Pulitzer Prizes for a story that in the end turned out to be fake news and just complete hooey, as they say. Well, I don't know about that. I think I remember in the summary one specific line that it said was, that you know, it doesn't convict President Trump of anything, but that it doesn't exonerate him either. How can, so, it, how can it not exonerate him? The well, summary I don't know. that we have says he didn't collude with Russians. It sounds like he didn't collude with Russians, but it's not at all saying he's not, he's, he's not exonerated from anything. That's what it said. So. Well, I think that line was in relation to the obstruction of justice, yeah. which was the second half of the Mueller investigation, but if Rod Rosenstein and William Barr have decided that there isn't enough evidence to charge them with obstruction. I think we should trust them on that judgment, especially considering Rosenstein especially being one of the most anti-Trump people to serve in Washington. He even discussed removing the president via the 25th Amendment earlier last year. And also, something I would say is, about the obstruction thing, I, like lots of Democrats like Maxine Waters are clinging to this, and it's like, how can he obstruct something if there's no underlying crime? That doesn't seem to make much sense. Like, what? Well, obstruction is the crime. But like, how would he be obstructing something when there's no crime? Well, Nixon didn't tap the wires. It was people working for his election committee, but he still got kicked out because he was obstructing. Because he, because he orchestrated crime. No, I mean, he had plausible did. deniability, so he could have denied it. But like he, we have tapes saying that he knew about it. Like Trump, there's no, there's been no convictions in the Mueller report related to collusion. They're all bank fraud, and like stuff and finance violations like that. Mm. But there's no collusion. And how can like I don't understand what you're talking about. It's still a crime. You can still obstruct justice. How can, how can you obstruct justice when there's no crime? That doesn't make because obstruction is the crime. I think we're bogged down here. I think I think something uh, to go off of Ben to keep in mind is that um, Bill Clinton was put on uh, impeachment trials for lying about the fact that he, he cheated on his wife, um, which isn't inherently a crime in itself. So yeah, he he um, 
he lied before Congress. He was under oath. Trump mm -hmm. didn't. I don't believe Trump was interviewed in the Mueller report. He was I don't not. think. I think he only the most he did was um, he submitted written questions. But like, you know, we'll see how it goes. There are yeah. uh, so uh, one of the outcomes of this uh, investigation is the fact that the uh, current uh, 2020 Democratic candidates are like still using this as uh, uh, back or a weapon against Trump, and um, I'm sure it will have a, a large impact on the 2020 election. Um, I think it could. I think the report can only help him if the summary is accurate. Like I hear, hear a lot of Democrats saying, like we need to see the full report, we need to see everything. But like, no, that's not how it works. Some things are going to be redacted, at because that's like federal law that you can't like just name people if they're not charged with crimes, and you have to keep some things redacted. I think we'll see most of the report. I think we'll see a lot of it. But like some of the Democrats are like saying because like Barr is going to be following federal regulations that like somehow he's hiding stuff when it's just like he's following the law, and I think. In the end, I think the Mueller report will only help Trump because he'll be able to use a club to go to those swing voters who were um, a bit skeptical of him back in 2016 and say, see, look, they were against me. I did nothing wrong. They're trying to distort the will of the American people, and they're still doing it. Like, I don't know. So, I, so you, uh, you don't see this as the next locker up um, sort of a thing? I think there might. I, there's a lot of push to have that I've been seeing in the media to have James Comey prosecuted. I think there might be, I doubt it, but I think there might be like a special investigation to the FBI's handling of this entire debacle as it has been revealed. But who knows? Yeah, I, I agree with you, Marcus. I think it could be the next locker up thing. I think even if he's cleared, you know, they're still gonna harp on it the same way, even though Hillary was cleared with her emails, you know, it was still something that would bring her down. So they're they're going to use the can, and that's something they'll have. All right. Um, does anybody have any more thoughts on the issue? All right. Um, we're going to pivot into our next topic, which is Brexit. Now on to our second topic of the night, Brexit. Brexit is rapidly approaching its self-proclaimed end date, March the 29th. Brexit faces inherently obvious problems. The British people and the British government want a deal that makes them special, where they control the movement of goods, services, and people, and a deal where they control their own trade deals, all while not having to deal with any of the consequences of their actions. This is obviously impossible. Another issue facing Brexit is that while most of the UK is an island nation with no land borders to the rest of the EU, there is still the province of Northern Ireland, which does have a land border with the Republic of Ireland, an EU member state, which has roads that crisscross the international boundary and in some place for no more than 100 yards before then returning back into the other country. This leaves the UK with a major issue. Should they put a border back in place, separating Northern Ireland from Ireland, they're going to re-spark the violence that has mostly gone away. Or do they put the international boundary within the UK, in the IRC, making domestic trade and domestic business an issue? Additionally, an inter internal international boundary is not a maximum Brexit, the whole focus of this issue and one that the government has been promising for years. Theresa May, the UK's Prime Minister, has repeatedly negotiated deals with the European Union only for them to be rejected by her own parliament. Many from both the Conservatives and the Liberals are trying to call off Brexit altogether, especially with recent reports from the Bank of England. The Bank of England has made a report that says if Brexit were to go through, there would be a significantly worse recession in the UK than that of the 2008 financial crisis. This is mostly due to businesses leaving and going elsewhere. Additionally, investment in the UK would most likely dry up as people want to invest in, in the larger market of the EU. A great example of this is the Dyson Company, which has recently moved its headquarters to Singapore. Overall, it will be interesting to see where in the future this goes, either another referendum or a hard Brexit. I would now like to return to our panelists for some comments on Brexit and another referendum. I'd like to reintroduce our panelists. I have Ben Bursey and Kane Wanta on the left and John Keenan, and now joined by Colin Slater on the right. So uh, Brexit is coming to a close rather quickly here. Um, 
Do, does anyone want to comment on Brexit? Well, it seems like it's pretty up in the air right now, you know. Um, doesn't seem like they really know what they want to do. I think I heard Theresa May just step down. So She's going to following the, if they come through with a deal, whether or not, but once the whole Brexit debacle is done with, she's going to, she announced that she's going to resign as Prime Minister. Yeah, so obviously it's not going that great. Um, if it goes through, it's going to be just really tough for them. Um, and if it doesn't, it's going to look really bad for the right in Britain. Well, what I think is happening is they're going to leave the EU. It's a question of whether or not there's a framework within it. Um, I remember seeing like statistics saying that 86% of the parties that are elected to the current um, British House of Commons said they would respect the Brexit, Brexit referendum. So I think there's a majority out there who wants to try and find a deal. It's just a question of what their relationship with the EU is going to look like that they have a bunch of troubles with. Like there are a bunch of people who want to push for like a hard Brexit where it's kind of like our relationship with the with the EU where we're just like two separate entities negotiating with each other. But then there are others who want it more um, more close relationship and maybe even like preserve their economic trade deals that they have and stuff like that. So it's going to be interesting how it pans out. I think one of the main problems is that they just don't really know where to go right now because they, there isn't like a clear majority opinion. It's kind of just like there's six different fractions that each wants six different things and none of them are coming together. So we'll see. Well, because, because no one's coming together, I think it's inevitable that we're going to see eventually at least a no-deal Brexit just because if no one's going to cooperate and that's the only thing that can happen if they don't cooperate, then that's just destined to happen. Whether or not each side wants it, if if the no one's if they're not willing to co work together and compromise, or one or one side works with other parties to get what they want, it's it's just not it's just going to be a no deal Brexit because they only get what they want. Uh, the Bank of England, the, uh, the National Bank of the UK, um, recently came out with an economic report that. In, uh, that included an expected recession that would be worse for the UK than the 2008 financial crisis. Do you think this is going to have any weight on the Brexit debate? I don't think that it can have, will have much debate. People are obviously scared about the economic futures of Britain because they're obviously not going to be, if they're not in the economic union with the EU, which is probably its main appeal to most nations, then they're going to be at a disadvantage and isolated um, economically, and they don't, frankly, have the resources or infrastructure to support themselves because they've been so integra integrated with Europe over the last years. So it's kind of like they're just going to have to come up with some solutions and trade deals to work it through. But I think also one of the ma main problems with the current um, with the current debates that I see is that Europe is trying to make an example out of Britain, and they're trying to like make it as difficult for them as it's possible to have a smooth leave because they obviously don't want to encourage other nations to do it. So they're saying, look at how bad they're doing. You don't want this, just stay in the EU. So I think both sides each are trying to kind of extort the other and they're not really coming up with real solutions. I feel like it's very easy for the EU to point fingers at the UK and go, look at how bad a job they're doing because it's just, <laughs> it's a complete mess. Um, uh, so uh, you mentioned earlier that people have thrown around the idea of having a second referendum where the people come out and re-vote on the issue. Would that be uh, likely? No. It, it, it's, well, I mean, likely, probably not. But in terms of if it does happen, it's ridiculous and outrageous. The people voted for what they want. It doesn't matter how close it was. It doesn't matter that I believe it was 52% to 48% was the vote with leave being the majority. It doesn't matter that, that, that there's, oh, it, like see, I see an argument. Oh, but 48% of people don't want to don't wanna leave. It's like, too bad, you lost. And it's like, you have to respect that. You can't just go again until you get the results that you want. Because I guarantee you, if there is by some chance a second referendum and the people of Britain still vote leave, you'll be hearing, 
you'll be the people will either A, be claiming that it was rigged or B, call for another one because they can't accept the results. I think another referendum would be good because um, it doesn't seem like the people really knew what they were getting into. It doesn't seem like the British government knew what they were getting into either. Um, and in the negotiations, from my perspective, it's just Britain asking to have all the benefits of the EU, but none of the burden. So the EU is saying, no, that's not how it works. You can't just take and not give anything back. So from my perspective, that's why the EU is telling Britain that um, the deals that they keep coming up with aren't ones that they can accept. Well, the issue with that is Britain was in the EU for, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe they joined in the 1990s. Yeah, I, uh, maybe earlier. In yeah, earlier some, sometime form. around that, in yeah. the 1980s, 1990s. They, they were fine for a while. I think the issue is that as an economic union, the, Euro, uh, the European Union is great. It's just as a, they're kind of growing in power and you, some um, people within the European Union are trying to increase the power of the European Union at the expense of the sovereignty of their member states, which you, you can't just do that because like, that's, just, that's just basically going towards the idea of a unified Europe, which was just all the cultural differences of Europe is just, and geographic too, it's just, I wouldn't say impossible, but it's nothing that can be achieved today. It just people are so different. It's what the, the main problem I see with having a second rec referendum is the fact that it will basically be just a referendum on Theresa May's Brexit deal. And though they, and it'll just be whether or not they like that, it won't be about the topic of leaving the EU itself. It'll be about how they leave it. And I see that that kind of just poisons the whole debate because they're trying to like, they're trying to, they're showing the public like this deal that is unpopular. And they're saying, you can either have this or stay in the EU. And they're obviously going to stay in the EU instead of trying to negotiate out a better deal. Like if they said, like if the referendum was like start over and um, start re renegotiate everything, or stay in the EU, I can maybe see it, but I, I feel like the debate is instantly going to be poisoned by the failings of Theresa May's government. Yeah, I definitely think that what's been going on will definitely sway the vote, but you know, if they don't like the way that it's been handled, it's been going bad, you know, I don't think they should stay, or I don't think they should leave because of how bad it's been going. Well, on that note, we are out of time and we will sadly have to end this episode. Uh, I'm Marcus Rowland and we will see you next time.